Hi everyone, thanks for attending my talk. Uh, today I'm going to talk about TPM file, which is related to some vulnerabilities on uh, trusted platform modules that can actually be exploited to leak uh, cryptographic keys from these uh, secure platforms. Uh, my name is Daniel Morimi. I'm a security researcher and I've been working as a PhD student on a few topics like microarchitectural attacks, side channels, and applying them to break uh, crypto implementations and Intel uh, and, and you can reach, reach out to me on my Twitter or there are information on my website as well. Uh, before I start my talk, I would like to also thank uh, my uh, collaborators in some of these works like uh, my advisors, Berg Sunar, Nadia Henninger, Thomas Eisenbart, and Jan Wieselman. Uh, before we uh, dive into the topic of this, uh, uh, this presentation, which is related to side channel crypto analysis, uh, we, we basically motivate on the fact that on uh, traditional crypto analysis, an attacker try to look at a crypto system, at the input and output of this crypto system, and try to find some flaws that can be used to leak the crypto key uh, by just finding some design flaw and things like that. Uh, a good example of this happened uh, 10 years ago uh, on PlayStation 3 that they were using ECDSA nuts in the proper way. And what happened then was that, so in ECDSA, we have like this uh, fancy equations here that we can uh, compute uh, a signature pair. And here in these equations, there is a nonce that is a secret value that needs to be generated for each signature uh, uniquely and randomly. And there is a private key here that, that is the private key for, for that uh, message. And what happened back then is that the designers of uh, PlayStation 3, they basically use the same nonce for all the messages and this equation turned to something like this. And when you do that, the problem is that if you just generate two messages and you subtract them from each other, you get a much simpler equation with just one unknown variable and you can just uh, calculate the private key from this. So this is a huge design issue and that's what uh, traditional crypto analysis is about, that people try to find design issue in the actual algorithm or the actual design of uh, some crypto system to break it. But in side channel crypto analysis, we are not playing the fair, the same fair game. We actually have more information about the, the system. And uh, the idea is that during the execution of a crypto system, we can learn some signal, uh, something like timing channel or other things that can actually be used to perform key recovery in a more efficient way. And there are lots of different type of side channels. For example, there is power attack, electromagnetic attacks, timing attacks, cache attacks. And these attacks, they are generally, they have a very complicated thread models because some of them can be conducted on, phys on a physical access device scenario. Some of them can only be done in a local attack scenario, like in the cloud. And some of them can also be done in remotely. And this actually makes it really complicated for uh, crypto developers to implement an algorithm to be secure against all, all these uh, different scenarios. Um, so we mentioned that today talk is about uh, trusted platform module. Uh, so just basic, what is trusted platform module? The basic idea is that uh, we know that uh, we cannot really rely on operating system or the hypervisor. Uh, for root of trust and security, because there are all sorts of attacks that compromise the system software, like there is, uh, there is root kits, there are different things. And uh, we know that even sometimes the CPU cannot be trusted as we have seen by attacks like Meltdown and Spectra. So the idea is we need something like hard the base of root of trust, and we have designed things like trusted platform module, for instance. Trusted platform module is a secure element that is a standard and it has to support a standard set of functionality. And the other promise of this uh, trusted platform module is that uh, it basically uh, defines a security chip that need to be secure against even uh, some of the physical attacks like, uh, like tampering and side channel attacks. And uh, these uh, TPM devices, uh, basically, when you have one of these, you can simply put all your crypto keys or important assets inside this, inside this kind of a safe. And if the OS or the cloud provider or any of the software level or even anything that runs basically on your CPU get compromised, they cannot uh, subvert the entire control and they cannot access to all of the information. So. 
What is inside this security chip or trusted platform module? There is a specific set of functionalities that is defined by trusted computing group and organization. And uh, basically based on this uh, definition, this trusted platform module has to support some uh, secure storage and also some uh, cryptographic functionalities like digital signatures. And uh, we're gonna talk about digital signatures more in this talk and uh, it's important, but <clears throat> in general, these digital signatures uh, can help us to execute signing operations more securely. And nowadays, uh, there are lots of software stacks like the Linux software stack or OpenSSL that they actually support using trusted platform module or TPMs for uh, performing signing operations, whether it's RSA or CDSA. And uh, another important aspect of these digital signatures is that you can actually use them to perform a remote attestation of uh, hardware from like uh, the other side of the internet. You don't know if uh, another party is running the correct firmware, the correct hardware, and you can use remote attestation to verify some of these promises. Uh, since 2010, Trusted Platform Module version 2 now supports elliptic curve digital signatures and uh, schemes like ECDSA or ECDAA, and these uh, schemes use uh, elliptic curves that are actually more efficient and uh, are actually more popular nowadays. So one thing we mentioned is that, okay, these uh, trusted platform modules, they have some uh, standard and they need to support a set of functionalities. Uh, but one thing that we are interested in to know also if these devices actually support any if this standard supports any implementation standard, like how do we know if these uh, hardware devices, the, se the security chips are actually implemented properly? So TCG expect uh, designers and developers of these products to maintain uh, security assurance according to common criteria and the uh, level of assurance they expect is EAL4+. Plus. And uh, if you go on the TCG website, you can also find a list of devices that actually have proper certificates. And uh, for instance, in this picture, we see some devices from ST Microelectronics or New Voton or Infineon that, that are listed here. And uh, for example, one, one thing here we looked at is, uh, this is like a picture of ST Microelectronics uh, that I actually took from the laptop that I'm using today for this presentation. And uh, we looked at the data sheet of this, uh, this chip and it shows that, okay, this, uh, this, is, this supports resistance against side channel attacks. And we also looked at the evaluation and uh, here is the link for the evaluation of this uh, TPM chip. And uh, it's also like we made, like we looked at through the different uh, part of this evaluation. It says, okay, this is the version that is evaluated and this is the date that the evaluation has been uh, conducted. And there are some interesting information, like for instance, the, both the RSA and ECC keys are actually used for endorsements of this uh, device, which is the root uh, security key that is used for these devices. And there is also uh, other things that says, for instance, this device need to maintain security of all the assets inside it. And the, the list of assets is defined by the uh, protection profile, the user key or other other keys that are stored in the storage, they all need to be protected uh, for the implementation of these devices. And uh, more explicitly, it also says that uh, this uh, evaluation supports side chain attacks and timings attacks and uh, attacks like SPA and DPA. And there's also other information like, uh, uh, yeah, the standard that it needs to support physical manipulation and physical probing is covered. So. We see that basically this says that, okay, this uh, device actually supports mitigation against this uh, sidechain attack. So now the question is, okay, should we just rely on these certificates and say, okay, this is done, this is a secure device or not? Uh, so the first thing we wanted to basically test is the simplest test that's uh, also very practical is a timing test. Because if you can recover any key from these devices using a timing attack, it's actually very valuable. And uh, it's an attack that is not intrusive. It can even maybe done remotely. So to build a testing uh, tool and measure the timing of these TPM devices, what we did is that we looked at uh, uh, the CPU cycle count because we realized that most of these TPM devices are implemented on a very low cost uh, microprocessor that may run like a hundred times slower than 
uh, CPU. So using CPU cycle count is a good good way to measure time uh, for these devices uh, without any special equipment or anything. anything. Uh, so one of these devices that we, we looked at initially was called Intel Platform Trust Technology or Intel FTPM. This Intel FTPM, the idea is that they have implemented the TPM features as 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 it is defined by TCG as a module that runs on the CSME or management engine uh, inside the same die as the P CPU. And this management engine also runs its own microprocessor, so it's separate from the CPU. So even if the CPU gets compromised, you cannot really, uh, you are not supposed to have access to that microprocessor even though if they are on the same die. Uh, and, and this has been around now for a long time since Haskell, and it's very popular because uh, most computers and laptops nowadays, they can just rely on, on these if they have an Intel CPU and they don't need to attach a separate uh, trusted platform module, a dedicated trusted platform module to your motherboard. Uh, we did an initial, uh, initial uh, timing test and we realized that, okay, if we run uh, a CDSA on this uh, TPM, uh, firmware TPM, we see that for different executions of the same uh, ECDSA function with the same private key, the timing operations are actually different uh, for different execution. And here we see a histogram of uh, different, uh, histogram of a number of uh, signature operations and their timing. So this got kind of our curiosity, like, okay, so we see as timing behavior here, this is interesting, can we do better? So what we did is that we basically implemented a, a tool to do this timing measurement more precisely. Our tool basically uh, overrides some of the functionality of the Linux uh, kernel stack for TPM. And this, uh, this functionality, when it's overridden with, with our tool, we can actually measure the time of the TPM operation as close as possible to the interface of the TPM device. And by doing that, we can get a very high resolution timing of what's actually uh, going on or if there is any, anything interesting. And when we did that, we saw that, okay, this uh, Gaussian distribution actually become even more, more separated. And we see that there are two different brackets here in, the, in this uh, timing operation that is measured by, with a root axis. So we use the same key to generate all the signatures. And this actually told us that, okay, if we use the same key to generate all the signatures, the only thing that is changing is the nonce, and that could be the reason that we see this timing behavior. So we looked at the nonces for some of the signatures we generated, and we realized that there is actually a leakage behavior that is directly correlated with the bit length of the nonce. So for example, if we execute uh, this uh, a signature operation and this is the nonce that is used, we see some, some timing like this. And if there is like four bits window of leading zero bit at the beginning of the nonce, we see that the timing is much faster. And so and so, we see that for every additional four bit window of leading zero bits at the nonce, the signature is generated much faster. And for instance, if we have like uh, 12 leading zero bit in a signature, the signature may be slowed, maybe faster, like for more than three milliseconds, uh, which is a very high timing behavior that may be even be observable um, over a network. And here I prepared uh, basically a demo of how uh, such, an, such an attack works that we can uh, collect timing measurements. Uh, first, we use a script to generate uh, open SSL generate a ECDSA key using OpenSSL, and then we program the device uh, with this key. So this script runs, we program the device with a new new key for ECDSA operation. And um, if you look at the key, we see that, okay, uh, we have generated a 256-bit uh, ECDSA key, and yeah. And here is the key, the private key, starts with the hex value 92 and so on. And then we have another script here that basically uses our tool to measure the time and also run a TPM signing operation. So we use this tool basically to generate signatures and also measure the time of execution of that signature. And when we uh, run this tool, we see that a new entry has been added that it has some signature pair and some timing values. And if we keep running this uh, script, we see that, okay, another entry has been added. So in our, for our attack, we basically run this script for a while, and uh, here we have also a live histogram of what's happening here, that we see that uh, as we generate the signature, some of these signatures 
are faster. And this means that the bit length of the nonce was uh, shorter for those signatures. And this histogram, as we see, is populated with this uh, bit length value. And we see that uh, uh, some of the signatures are faster. And for an attack, we are generally interested for the signatures that are on the, on the left brackets because we know that they have some bias in their nodes. So this was a vulnerability basically we found on Intel FTPM or Intel PTT. And uh, even though this device has some uh, security uh, guarantees like the uh, FIPS uh, certificate, but it doesn't have any CC evaluation and it's not listed on Trusted Computing Group uh, website. So we were interested to also see if there are similar vulnerabilities in other TPM devices. So we used our tool to do timing test of uh, a bunch of computers that we had in the lab. These computers, some of them, they just use the Intel uh, F FTPM. And when we re ran this uh, test on Intel FTPM, almost all of the devices that were using this Intel FTPM were vulnerable to this timing behavior. And then uh, we also found some interesting thing and uh, interesting other timing behaviors on other devices, like on Nubotone and Infineon. But the only other interesting vulnerability we found was on ST microelectronic TPM device that we also earlier showed that it's, it's supposed to be resistant against this attack. And here is basically the histogram we we drew for the for the timing behavior of ST microelectronic, and we see that uh, even though at the first glance it looks like a balanced uh, Gaussian distribution, but the, we have more samples on the left side, and it actually gave us an idea that okay, this may also have a timing behavior. So we looked at the nonces again, and we we realized that okay, this is a very similar vulnerability co to, compared to the Intel FTPM ECDSA operation. But this time, instead of for every additional four bit window uh, leading zero bits, we see that for every additional leading zero bits, for every one leading zero bits, we see that the timing is, is faster. And uh, we also looked at that, okay, there is a linear correlation between the bits length of the nonce and the, and the timing. So this, again, gives us the similar leakage behavior. So. So far, we have just talked about, okay, we have some vulnerabilities uh, on this ECDSA operation of these devices, and this vulnerability tells us uh, some number of bits about the nonce for uh, ECDSA operation. But uh, this information by itself is not useful. We need to use this information to recover something that is more valuable, like the private key for ECDSA. And um, for, for this purpose, we basically came up with a, with a systematic attack. And this systematic attack, assuming that the TPM is programmed with a private key, with an unknown private key, we can basically, what we do is that we collect a list of signatures uh, using this TPM device. And these signatures are collected with their timing. And we use the timing basically to filter signatures to a group that has some bias, some non-bias. For instance, we know that all the signatures that are generated in less than X amount of cycle uh, are supposed to be eight bits uh, short, for instance. And when we have those biases, we basically can use a technical lattice-based attack, and using this lattice-based attack, we can recover the private key. So I'm not going to get into the detail of how lattices work. There are lots of mathematics behind behind that, and it's beyond uh, the scope of this talk. Uh, but the idea is that uh, we can rewrite that ECDSA equation we showed earlier as a simpler equation that has some known values and some unknown values. And then when we replace the known values with some simple uh, like variables, we have just this equation that has two unknown. And for these two unknowns, we cannot simply calculate any of them because we, uh, we need at least one of them to calculate the other. But the reality is we have some information about the value of the nonce or KI. And this value, this uh, information tells us the KI cannot be bigger than some amount because we know the bit length of KI for some of these signatures. And this uh, uh, basically resembles a very well-known uh, well problem of hidden number problem that was uh, proposed a long time ago. And it can actually 
efficiently be calculated and we can efficiently recover the private key from this if we have enough uh, signatures with this quality. And uh, what we did is basically we use this information, we construct a lattice. Uh, this lattice is described in a form of a matrix here, and this lattice basically form a problem that is uh, that is well studied in the in the lattice based crypto community. And this problem basically uh, tells us that okay, we want to solve a shortest vector, and if we solve this problem, we can actually recover the private key. And uh, surprisingly, this problem can be solved in a polynomial time, and there are some algorithms like LLL and BKZ that we can execute uh, on this lattice to recover the private key. And uh, we did that, and it, it actually worked. And here is also a, a demo for this attack, basically. So for the same key that we showed earlier, we collected more results here. We have, for instance, 25,000 signatures that we generated. Uh, the signatures now we can see that okay, uh, this, these are the histo these are the Gaussian distributions, and uh, we are probably more interested in the signatures that are generated faster. So here, if we look at uh, at the value 4.7 uh, to the to the 10 to the 8, uh, this these are the signatures that probably have 8 bit of leading zero bits because this is this is the second window here. So we program this value to our tool. Uh, we filter all the uh, signatures that are executed at, that fast. And when we filter these signatures, we realize that there is only a 99 sig signature out of this 25,000 signature that they have this quality. And we save these 99 signatures. And then we use another script that we have uh, programmed using Sage. And this script basically randomly pick uh, 60 different signature. Uh, from this uh, set of filtered signatures to run the lattice attack. And here we also have the same private key 92 to check as a ground truth to see if our attack works. And if our attack works, this function solve, solve CVP is gonna uh, recover the key. If the key matches that the key that we have put here as a ground truth, then the attack works. And here is the simple uh, definition of the uh, lattice in, in matrix form and running the LLL algorithm uh, in the code. So if we run this, we basically see that, okay, uh, our attack works even when we s randomly pick different set of samples. And every time the key, this, the correct key is recovered. So uh, this was basically uh, a, an efficient attack. We saw that, okay, running the attack actually uh, doesn't take that much time. The only the only thing that takes time is collecting those signatures because depending on the on the amount of leakage we have, if we have four bit leakage or eight bit leakage, we need to collect different amount of signatures. And we have some numbers in the paper in more detail, but the end result is that you can recover the crypto key very efficiently on both Intel FTPM and ST Microelectronic, especially if you have a local access that that's very fast and. Uh, it just signature generation may take some some time. So <laughs> after we did this, it was like okay, we have a almost remote attack on TPM devices, which means that uh, this TPM is even not supposed to leak these keys with a physical attack, but we can already leak these keys uh, from the CPU because uh, we can measure the timing and leak these uh, ECDSA keys. But can we do these attacks on a real? remote like network or remote timing attack like as is known by the community like in, a, in the world. So what we looked at is, okay, these uh, TPM devices, they are running with a very slow frequency. And because of that, the timing difference for every of these uh, short signatures, the different brackets is different. For instance, for the Intel FTPM, the time difference for each of those uh, group of peaks we saw is like about more than one millisecond. Which means that if you have like 12 bit of uh, uh, zero at one nonce, that signature is gonna be executed like for more than three seconds uh, faster. And that means that on most local networks on, or even some internet networks, this can be ki kind of observed. And for instance, here I have like a, the round trip time on my local network of pinging another device in my lo local network. And we see that the time it takes to do a round trip is like less than a millisecond, which means if I have a leakage that is like three millisecond uh, delay, this is something that probably can be observed 
uh, easily over even a local network. And even on some remote networks here, if I ping Cloudflare, it takes 20 milliseconds. So maybe this is even observable observable over, over uh, uh, online like uh, like uh, internet network. Uh, well, we didn't do an attack on internet network, but on a local network, we try to see if this what is the impact of this attack on a local network. So we picked up an application, uh, a VPN application that actually has the instruction how to use a strong sound VPN to configure it to use TPM for authentication. So when we configured a strong sound VPN to use uh, TPM for authentication, what we realized is, okay, uh, the first handshake is the same. There is a, a DFL man key exchange at the first handshake with the server. And then after this DFL man key exchange, both the client and the server, they both have the shared key for encryption of their packets. But then the client also need to make sure the server is the correct server. So it's not a <coughs> impersonated server. So then the authentication happens in the next uh, IKE exchange protocol. And then during the next exchange, the VPN server doesn't even have the access to the key and it's going to ask the TPM device, hey, this is a message, please sign this for me. And then the server asks the TPM device to sign the message and the TPM device signs the message and then the server just gets the response and send it to the client. And the client can verify that, oh, this server is a legitimate server. Uh, and the good thing about using this TPM is that, okay, now even if the server is compromised, nobody can have access to that private key, uh, so nobody can impersonate the VPN uh, server, uh, the role of the VPN server, basically. But the, the bad thing about this is that not, if we have vulnerability on the TPM device, then every time there is a handshake, you can measure the time. So here what we did is that after the second handshake, we just drop the connection and we repeat this operation again and we collect uh, lots of timing measurement. After doing this, we again applied the same attack that we explained as our local attack on the as a root adversary. And with the local attack, with the remote attack, we again managed to recover the private key from a, from a VPN server. And uh, for this attack, we needed like about forty four thousand handshakes uh, with the VPN server that we configured on a local network. That takes about like five hours to collect this amount of signature. And the attack is also uh, about 60% uh, of the times is successful with this, with this network. And here also we see a comparison of different uh, histograms that we generated for this Intel FTPM vulnerability. And we see that uh, for system level adversary, the leakage is almost as clean as if we already know the BIOS, there is no interesting uh, statistics behind it. It's just clean leakage. And for the remote attacks, the uh, leakage is noisier and the remote attack with VPN protocol even is more lazier, more noisier. But what is clear is that there is a still possibility to leak, leak the key. And we, we actually showed that you can uh, recover the private key over a network. So uh, you may be surprised, okay, why, why are there such problems on these TPM devices? And uh, this is not actually the first time that we show such a uh, vulnerability on some uh, deployed crypto products. Um, like two years ago, around two years ago, we showed that uh, another product that's, uh, that uses the signature schemes, like a signature scheme called EPID that also use elliptic curve, uh, ha actually has this leakage. And we show that on Intel SGX product, uh, their secure, uh, their uh, coat coating enclave that is used as part of the remote attestation is actually vulnerable. And using a cache attack, we could actually recover the private key for remote attestation. So this, uh, why, why, why is it so easy to break this crypto implementation when it comes to side channel attack? Uh, the reason is that implementing this crypto implementation is really hard. It's really hard to uh, implement them to be resistant against all sorts of different uh, side channel attacks. Uh, if we look at the ECDSA, for instance, as we talked a lot about ECDSA, is that uh, we, we, there is a simple equation here that, okay, this is the ECDSA signing operation, but in reality, there is more going on in the back and implementing this uh, is much more complicated than it seems. Uh, so for an elliptic curve, we have like a curve, this is called the elliptic curve, and it's defined that, okay, this is a secure curve. And then uh, we have two primitive operations. One operation is called double, that after we double a point, 
point, we get another point on the same curve here. And again, for another operation called add, we add two points together and we pass a line through these two points and we get another point here mirrored down there. And these are the two basic operations, but using these two basic operations, we can implement more complicated operations. For instance, during the CDSA signing operation, one complicated operation is the scalar multiplication. And we can implement a scalar multiplication using a series of double and add operations, as we can see that, uh, for instance, multiplying 3, 7, 23 different numbers with a point can be done using this add and double operation. And this gives us a simple algorithm. We can use this to implement the CDSA. But there is not a single implementation of this algorithm, and we see that this algorithm has behavior depending on the key bits. And there are so many other algorithms. There is like double add algorithm that we showed. There is Montgomery double add. There are like a sliding window, fixed window. So there are so many different ways to implement the same functionality that is part of this ECDSA signature. And uh, in our case, the showcase we showed in fixed window in uh, Intel FTPM, it was actually a fixed window implementation that was leaking, leaking for every four bit window. Um, but if you are designing crypto system, this is very difficult because uh, you are not sure what is the threat model. You may implement this crypto system to run on a cloud, but then later on you may use the same code to run it on an airplane. And people have told you not to implement your own crypto, so you just copy paste the same crypto library from one design to another. And this makes it really difficult. And uh, a while back, we actually were curious, okay, how can we find these leakages uh, automatically instead of trying to attack every specific uh, implementation on different platforms? And uh, one thing we, we came up with here is that, okay, uh, all these software-related uh, side channel leakages, uh, they have uh, some characteristics. They either happen due to a secret-dependent control flow, like when you do a loop or uh, if a statement that depends on the key bit, or when you try to do a memory access depending on the key bit, like when we see that in, in some block ciphers like AES, that they have something called S-Box. And, and in some rare cases, there are also some instructions that they leak some value about the input, like on some ARM CPUs, for instance, this has been reported. But the idea is that, okay, we want to have an automatic tool and we want to apply this understanding to recover these leakages from a software perspective without even caring uh, what computer or what thread model we are running to. Uh, so. In reality, the way uh, our tool, which we call it micro work, work, is that so in practice, an attacker learn about the execution time, the memory usage behavior, the cache access pattern. But in theory, in the principle, what happens is that the attacker learns something about how many instructions are executed or, or what branches have been taken or uh, what is the memory access. Uh, pattern of the software. And so we, let, we said, okay, we're going to try to have a more tight model and we just look at the principle of why the leakage happened. Uh, so we came up with this tool and the idea is we generate a set of random test cases and we feed these random case, test cases to the implementation of a, a crypto operation. And while we are generating, while we are feeding these test cases, we also generate the execution trace of uh, this crypto operation. And then uh, one way to see if there is a leakage, we can we we show that we can check the difference between the traces for the same, uh, for different inputs. And another way we also use mutual information. We said for every instruction that has been executed during the execution of uh, uh, this crypto system with different inputs, we're going to calculate a mutual information score. And we say, uh, we, we look at how, if this mutual information is positive. If there is a score associated with the instruction, it means that that instruction was involved with the operation that took different amount of different, uh, different inputs or different amount of execution. And that actually tells us uh, there is a relationship between uh, the leakage and that instruction. So using that, we can actually also look at which instructions are leaky. And the, the, our tool, the way it works is that first we generate these traces and we do some, uh, some tweaks to the, to the generation during the execution. We use something like Intel pin tool to, to bi do binary instrumentation so it can work on uh, binary software that we don't have access to the source code. And then we do some pre-processing of the trace because some of these uh, operations, like they have different address space because of uh, ASLR or because of memory allocation. So we try to normalize the trace so we don't have uh, false positive. And we also apply some leakage granularity, like you may be interested in cache level uh, attack or page level attacks and things like that. And then 
be applied the analysis that we mentioned. Mm -hmm. So we had this tool, but uh, apparently the vendor didn't have access to, to such a tool or they didn't uh, care enough to use it. And uh, this is the, basically the responsible disclosure we had with ST Microelectronic. We reported this vulnerability to them uh, about a year ago, and we had lots of exchanges with them to help them to uh, update the framework for this device and fix these devices. And later on, uh, some vendors like HP and Lenovo issued some firmware updates to fix this issue. For Intel, uh, we also had a responsible disclosure that was a little bit longer, about nine months. Uh, and then uh, similarly, we reported this issue. And what's interesting is after we reported this issue, they told us that uh, the reason they had this vulnerability was that they were using an outdated version of library. And this also matches our, our previous reports because we already reported uh, similar vulnerabilities in Intel IPP, which is an official crypto library by uh, Intel, as part of our study of the MicroWalk tool. And we already reported these vulnerabilities like two years before, like in 2018, but later on again, the same vulnerability uh, ha appeared in another product, another consumer product, actually. And that's actually an interesting thing that sometimes uh, the knowledge you gain from cache attacks and analyzing software decades can be transferred to a totally different type of side channel and with even uh, more bad consequence on the products. Uh, this is my talk, and here are some links about our tool, uh, about this attack, and uh, also this paper will appear also at Usenix Security Symposium, uh, which uh, happens soon right after the Black Hat. Yeah, so I have one qu one question in the chat window that asks, uh, from what I can remember, TPMs should be generating key materials with an artificial response time to prevent this type of timing attack. Your results show this is not true, but is that a problem in the standard or the TPM vendors? I I believe that the TPM standards, the TPM standard itself doesn't uh, in, impose how the vendors are supposed to implement that actual TPM hardware, but the CC certification when it's at level four or five expect the TPM vendors to have some mitigation. So I don't know if, I hope that clarified uh, the answer for that. Uh, any other question? I don't see more questions, but uh, I would like to again thank the audience for listening to my talk. Uh, yeah.